Welcome to Amazon Legends, where we have real stories about making it big on Amazon. Our guests are CEOs of large companies and entrepreneurs who became power sellers. Also providers specializing in helping sellers, aggregators that acquire sellers, and former Amazonians will give us an insight from behind the scenes. Here is your host, Nick Urison. Welcome to another episode of Amazon Legends. Uh, my next guest today is actually, he's revisiting us, but almost two years ago now when I started, uh, he was my guest and uh, we had such a great discussion. So he's the director of operations at uh, Ruby Hibiscus and uh, his specialty is a CPG startup. So he's like one of those task force guys. He goes in, starts operations, at the time, he was doing it for almost a decade, and now obviously it's more than that. And uh, it's primarily food and beverage. And when he's not working, he's actually a, an avid uh, amateur boxer to the extent that he won the New England Golden Gloves Championship in 2018. And he also teaches boxing. So I hope he's still doing that. And with that, everybody, meet my guest, Zach Cohen. Welcome back to the show, Zach. Well, thanks for having me back, Nick. You know, when we spoke three years ago, some of those past accolades seemed a lot more recent. And now I feel a lot older when you say it. And it's crazy, too, <laughs> in three years. So much has changed. It feels like in some ways it was yesterday, but in other ways, you know, especially just on Amazon, e-commerce, where we are, it's almost felt like a decade worth of tech technology has taken over. We're in a whole new stratosphere. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a favorite saying that uh, it, it, it reminds me of these situations where you know time flies and then at the same time, it's so many things happen, but it's like yesterday. And uh, it's like you can live a lifetime in a minute. So if you think yeah. about it, uh, very meaningful, right? It's one of those e-commerce. And when you're in CPG, to top it all off, those minutes go by very, very fast. And it's always ever changing. You're always on the, the next cutting edge of something else. And things happen fast and competitive in this in this industry, for sure. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to discuss with you is actually going to be very useful for our listeners is a, kind of a progress report in the sense that because you, you came into this already with experience knowing what to do. That was one important point. So you had a plan for your product and it's a drink product. And at the same time, you were not just looking at Amazon. You had a strategy to also distribute in physical stores, but right there also you had focus to distribute in New England so you were thinking, we're going to do New England physical distribution, and we're going to build direct-to-consumer, and Amazon was part of the, the plan. So that was the, the plan. And when we recorded, you had not yet uh, started the operations, but you were about to. So now it's almost two years. I am, first of all, very happy to see you back because a lot of sellers start and they disappear within a year. So obviously that's not the case for you. And at the same time, you've got some very credible amount of knowledge based on the most recent development. So give us your story about what worked, what didn't work. I'm especially interested in those and also where you're going from here. Yeah, well, I'm really glad you kept those receipts from the last conversation. And I'm also proud to say that we've actually executed that plan in its entirety. And that was the goal. And that's still the goal. It was expand our distribution, start locally, gain a following while also starting to grow D2C presence primarily on Amazon. So the last time we talked, we actually, we had not yet launched an Amazon. And this was partially due to what I talked about last time. You know, I had a lot of experience on Amazon and a lot of that experience was, was failure, was doing stuff too rush, doing stuff too fast and not understanding the nuances. And this time around when we launched on Amazon, 
the key was we wanted to do it right. We wanted to hit all those little intricacies, we wanted to, you know, position our product, position our pricing, position our advertising strategy, make sure our inventory was all settled and ready to go, and then launch with a plan. And I would say we've been pretty successful with that. We launched on Amazon and we've cracked the top 10 in our category on many different occasions. We have been in a position where we, uh, you know, we've, we've run different promos and have had success there. We haven't had any out of stock situations. We've continued to get good reviews and um, it just goes side and side also with our distribution plan, primarily locally in Whole Foods, where we've seen our revenue and both our feedback continue to grow, grow and grow in our presence in the CPG and the beverage space uh, going hand in hand there. Okay. So I want to understand the things that you've done. So uh, first of all, explain to us because there is a, there's a big word in how you started describing positioning. So yeah, this is like your physical positioning. So positioning in business is the most important thing. And a lot of businesses don't do that. And it's a fairly heavy exercise that you have to go through to define your positioning statement. So um, break it down for us. What was the positioning as far as the, what your company wanted to do? Yeah. I mean, if, if everyone can leave here with one takeaway, I want it to be two things. <laughs> On Amazon or just even in general, right? You need to have two things. You need to have a really good product and you need to have a competitive price. And if you don't have a good product, you better have a really, really good price. And if you don't have a good price, you better have a really, really good product. So you need to somehow balance the two of them. And we, we can talk every Amazon acronym, A-B testing, tacos, acos, whatever you want to talk about and how that affects everything. But ultimately, you got to start with those two things. And you have to build some type of reputable product with reviews that people will tell their friends about and go back for more. So for us, that was the biggest thing and why we want to start in retail, especially in a food and beverage product was we need to have people talking about it more. So people talking about it positively. So right then and there, it was positioning the product to be exactly what it is. We do demos out in the field. And from there, we're able to hear what customers like about it. We then take those attributes for example people like the taste they like the low calorie aspect they like that there's no sugar and then we can position those as our amazon keywords so before launching on amazon we had to prove our proof of concept out in retail out with people actually trying it people giving it to their friends and family and that's where we started um and then the pricing you know the, your industry has a set price where people are competitive for you as a business in order to hit that price you need to start with one, two, three, four, five, one A, one B, one two A, and so forth with your margins, right? So if you have to look at your margins very, very deeply, and if your margins aren't able to succeed at the price point that's competitive, you got to sell a different product. So for us, it was about analyzing that, looking at our margins, seeing what we could do that was, you know, help us get profitable on Amazon and, uh, and go from there. Well, just pricing and also the the customer experience. So the customer experience, so your customer experience approach is extremely smart. Uh, so I, I was watching this little presentation about uh, marketing in general, but primarily marketing online. So the speaker was saying a similar thing to what you said, which is a, a great tip for our listeners, any seller, really. Yeah, what he was saying was share your product with the people and let them tell you what they think about it. And then take their words and incorporate into your copy. Because that does two things. Number one, obviously the SEO value and you know, listing optimization content whatever. But most important, it resonates with the user because you are using their own words. It reminds me of the movie, you know, when Harry met Sally. So this, they're, they're talking to couples and then each one is completing the other sentence. 
<laughs> so it it becomes like that, right? So your your information starts to connect with the buyer, which is a huge deal. That's what will make the purchase. So uh, that I find extremely uh, smart. And then also as far as the price point, I have a question there. So as you know, there are always cheaper products, cheaper versions of what you're selling. And they tend to be more in quantity. So now suddenly you have this massive competition at a lower price point. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, that's the catch 22 of it all is the lower the price point, sometimes the higher the quantity. And Amazon favors both of them. You know, a, a lower quality product at a very competitive price point is going to do well on Amazon. A very good product at a competitive or higher tier price point is going to do well on Amazon. A lot of time it's those middle tier products, I feel like, that don't really take off. I mean, if you have the quality and price point, I don't it. the market will set the price for you. If you have a really low price, you're just always going to do well. But then you as just a marketing channel. For yeah, I guess that's the beautiful balance of Amazon as well, or just even retail and shopping in general. Lower quality and lower price items are always going to be accessible, and there's always going to be a need for those. And that's why dollar stores exist, and that's why lower budget stores exist. On the other end of the spectrum, better quality prices, i sorry, better quality products at a bit of a higher price as long as the market is willing to pay for that price, if the quality is there and the reputation is there, in my experience, people are willing to pay for it. But you need to find exactly on the matrix where you stand, on the low, on the highest quality, on the pricing, and find that competitive balance. And you as a business, and this is, I think, the most important things that I see a lot of people starting out on Amazon miss, is they say, in order to be successful in my industry, I need to be at $10 a unit, let's make up. But if your cost of goods and your margins aren't upwards in paying the industry, I would say at least 50, 60 percent after your fees, after your storage costs, after your freight out, you're not going to be profitable. And it needs to be something you look at very deeply just to stress again. You got to start with your margins, margins, margins. And as Amazon is just a, a marketing channel for you again, then you need to live with that and just understand you're going to lose money. But if it's something that you want to do to be profitable, you need to take a deep look at that matrix. Where am I on this pricing? Where is my quality? And then take an inward look at your margins and understand from that price point, from my cost of goods, from my other operating costs, what's my bottom line going to be? And also, you know, you have to factor in your, uh, your promos, your lightning deals, your other advertising keywords that you're putting in. And I can't stress it enough. And it's just, you have to look at all those different costs there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's all about the numbers. First of all, people become obsessed with how many pieces are you selling per day? And yeah, of course, we know sales velocity is important, but sales velocity is also relative to your historical performance, not relative to what others are doing. So it comes down to, are you profitably selling an item or not? If you keep selling it, but you're not turning profits, then it makes no sense to be selling. Uh, so that's what you're getting at. And, and this is where the deep understanding of the PNL, primarily the bottom of the PNL is what matters, is something that people don't really analyze so much in terms of margin. So I had a financial head of an aggregator uh, on the show a while ago, and he said something that I always repeat percentages are the language for us to understand the financials. What that means is your storage costs, your advertising costs, your FBA fees. As a percentage of the top line, your total sales, what do they represent? You've got to be able to translate that. So Amazon provides their settlement report. It is full of line items and, and it's useless as it is. So you have to take it and then process it in a way that will give you that line by line in terms of groups of expenses to see as a percentage of your total sales, what is that number? 
And by the way, in that, what I find is promotions, discounts, they play a huge role because what happens is you take the sales and you post it to your books after the discount because discount, it doesn't matter. You give it away and it's the net sales that matter to you. But that was not your plan to start with because you set a price, say say $39.95, and then you say, okay, I'm going to pay 15% to Amazon. I'm going to pay, my FBA will be about 12%, and, and, and then your advertising fluctuates. And then you say, okay, we're going to make about 8% or 20% or 30%, whatever. Then bang, you offer a coupon code for 15%. <laughs> All those plans out the window, right? And so you have to post the gross and the discount so you can see the kind of impact those discounts are having. Do you do your uh, management that way? Yep. And, you know, going back to our first conversation, that was a lot of stuff I failed at originally was you took a price point and you said, all right, we sell in retail for X amount. We can probably survive on Amazon for even a little bit lower because, you know, our competitors are a little lower priced. All right, I'll throw a campaign here. I'll throw a campaign there. All of a sudden, at the end of the year, when you're reconciling your books, you realize I have a negative 20% contribution margin. I didn't factor in the freight to ship there. So yeah, when we first spoke, you know, that was some of the stuff that I initially failed at on Amazon, where after you're looking at, you know, your price in retail, you say, hey, I can probably survive the same price on Amazon, maybe even discount a little bit more because that's what our competitors are doing. Let me throw a lightning deal here. Let me throw a promo here. Let me buy some keywords. Um, and all of a sudden you're shipping there, you get a refund, you get a return at the end of the year, you're reconciling it and you have a negative 20% contribution margin and you're, you're looking at like, where did this come from? So you have to bake it all in and factor in those costs. And that's why I keep saying, you just got to start with those margins and look at it from there. If you can't compete at your industry price point, sell a different product or find a different channel. It's going to be of the utmost importance. You know, I'm throwing out a lot of numbers here, but to not overcomplicate it, it's really as simple as the four P's to teach you marketing one-on-one, just your product and your price, and then your promotion. So if we give a concrete example here, let's use round numbers. If you sell a unit for $10, already bake in what your discounts are going to be. If you're going to have 20% promotions throughout the year, prime days, all that stuff, take 20% off of the top line. So your net sales are already $8. If it costs you, and I hope that your margins are north of 50, it costs you $3 to make it. All of a sudden, on the bottom, you know, now you have $5 of revenue to play with. And now you're factoring your FBA costs. Let's say that's a dollar. And then your storage costs another 80 cents. And now you're shipping out there. And your item might be bulky. It might be small. When it gets onto a pallet and ships out there, you have extras. Bake it all in and look at your bottom line after that. So, yeah, obviously... I'm an operations guy, so these numbers are important. But once you get to a, a number on the bottom that's sustainable and definitely isn't negative and has a nice crooked number to it, most likely, then you can start playing around with a lot of the fun stuff. And that's when you can really take your business on Amazon to the next level. But you have to get past that first step, product price and your own internal margins. And then you can start having fun, your A-B testing and take it to the next level. Personally, I feel you're going to have a very hard time surviving as a business if you can't get past those initial stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, when I was a kid, there was this game that that we used to play. You know, I'm thinking of a number between one and <laughs> hundred. So guess what it is. So you would start guessing. Is it uh, uh, higher than 50? Uh, no, it's not. Is it higher than 25? So you're narrowing it down, narrowing it down, right? So what I'm hearing is it's not necessarily just looking at the margin, but your capability to be able to narrow down where the unhealthy spending is. Because you you may, your, your top line, or I should say your price point may be healthy, your FBA fees may be healthy. Maybe you're running too high promotions. Maybe you're paying too much in storage because there, there is this phrase. I have quite a few Amazonians uh, on the show, uh, former Amazonians. And 
So they have these definitions. Uh, the, the language they have is, is, is always fascinating. So they call it controllable input. What are your controllable inputs? So in your case, your FBA fee is not controllable. It's fixed per SKU. Yep. But your storage is controllable. Your Obviously, your promotions, in this case, is advertising. That's controllable. And also, your promotions are controllable. But really, the moral of the story here is your accounting. It's not your numbers. It's your accounting. You have to set up your accounting in a way that you see what top line, your total gross sales before any discounts that you offer. Next line, your, the discounts you offer. Usually systems or people who don't know better, they combine the two and then just post net sales. Don't do that. Post the gross sales, post the promotions next, and then you show total net sales. And then under that, then you start to put your buckets together your FBA fees. This is purely the shipping costs that Amazon charges you as they ship. I call them item-based FBA. Another line item is Amazon commissions separately. And by the time you factor in the refunds and everything else, that kind of changes. So Amazon commissions, just the Amazon commissions. The next one is obviously advertising. And then I have another line, which is everything else. That is, it's not storage. Storage is a separate line, but basically anything Amazon charges you for, uh, you know, the clawback fee and refund fee, return fee, FBA inbound fee, and you name it. Um, all those, I combine them simply by taking the total fees minus the Amazon commissions, minus the item-based FBA, minus the storage, and that gives you everything else. So when you do that, what I end up with is each one of those brackets, or I should say buckets, is a percentage of the total sale. You know how much it's eating into your margin. And then perhaps your storage has spiked. Perhaps you've offered too much discount. Perhaps you didn't calculate the FBA fees, something else going on there. Maybe you, your measurements that you gave is different than what Amazon is using. Uh, so all these things then you can identify, but it comes down to how you account for the, the settlement report details. And most people are not set up to do that. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, yeah that's exactly yeah. right. And you know, it, it is complicated, but on the other hand, you don't need to be a CPA. You don't need to be an accountant to figure it all out. But I would highly recommend, you know, as we talk through it out loud, someone that hasn't had experience with it, it's going to be difficult. And if Amazon is a channel where you want to really succeed, all the things we're talking about, a lot of these, you know, quote unquote, boring numbers that we're bringing into play here are a huge piece of the pie. So, you know, even you know, even us, um, you know, we work with, we, we, we have an Amazon team, shout out to, to Elon over there, who's, who's taking into a lot of this into account. And I wouldn't be scared to bring in people that are experienced agencies that know what they're doing to take a look at this for you. Otherwise, you know, you look two years down the line, you're saying I'm growing, I'm growing, but you've lost X amount of money without even realizing it. So, I mean, like I said, you don't need to be a CPA to look at it, but where is your strength? If you're a great marketer, if you're someone that has great SEO skills, you might want to outsource some of that accounting because it's going to come back to bite you. I'm a operator. I used to be in the day to day. And, you know, like I said, we have a team now, so it's refreshing for me to kind of take a step back and look at the full macro picture, look at the numbers from, you know, reporting point of view, rather than me being in the weeds, shipping inventory, dealing with, uh, you know, putting cases in for a five cases being lost. So I guess my point there is being, you know, there's a lot of different moving parts. Don't be afraid to bring in the help that's necessary if you truly want to succeed. Yeah, I mean, I I, I was having the same conversation yesterday. 
with another former guest of mine because I uh, also reached out and then we had, uh, it's, it's like old friends, also two years ago. And by the way, she, to this day, she has the most downloaded episode because she completely shared everything. Uh, I love I would, it, man. <laughs> I would encourage uh, everybody to listen to her. It's uh, Her name is Danielle Vincent and um, she's a seller. So we were having this conversation. There is a cost for bringing an expert. But there is also a cost for not bringing an expert, right? For, uh, exactly. And, you know, I, I love numbers. I love formulas. I don't think there's a formula for this one. It's kind of the balance of what's your time versus energy versus what you, you know, it, there's no perfect formula. I can make up a ton of analogies here. But, you know, you just got to look at it is, Really want to succeed do you have these skills in certain areas yeah yeah um okay so bottom line you really have to know your numbers in terms of each expense group what do they represent as a percentage of your total sales your your gross sales and that's the key what i'm also interested in in finding out is as a new listing the first thing you need is obviously reviews. So how did you go about ramping up your review base? A couple of different ways. Um, one was just word of mouth. You know, when we're doing our demos in stores, if someone was a good fan, it was, hey, also, you know, you know, you can get you can buy a single unit here at Whole Foods. You can also now get a 12 pack case on Amazon and even vice versa. Now Whole Foods and Amazon are combined. There's a lot of different plays there that happens to benefit us. I know a lot of businesses would be in the same position, but word of mouth in that sense, go do a demo, go give a product out to a neighbor and say, Hey, by the way, if you like this, go give a review on Amazon, make sure you buy it, make sure you actually, um, you know, just don't give a, a fake review because they'll ding you for that, but actually buy the product, receive it and give an honest review. Another thing, um, which, you know, I have mixed feelings about is the Vine program where you can sign up to send products out to verified Amazon reviewers and they can give their feedback. I have mixed reviews with Vine. You know, if to be honest, if I had to do Vine again, I probably won't in the future, but it's, it's a good option. It obviously depends on your industry, your product and stuff like that. But I think if you talk to 10 people, you'll get 10 different opinions on Vine. Yeah. Well, first of all, it depends on your price point because yeah. you're not, not going to make a sale. So it will be zero price. And so if you have a high ticket item, it's not going to work. Uh, the next qualifier is, I should say, this is the first qualifier and then price comes into play. Is You have to be doing FBA. If you're not doing FBA, there is uh, yep. no vine. So if you're doing FBA and you have a low ticket item, uh, my recommendation is go for it. Uh, however, the expectations have to be real. In other words, as we record this in February 2024, they introduced three different tiers of Vine program. Before, you could enroll a parent. If you had variations, this would go towards the whole parent. 30 reviews, and it would cost $200. Now they have lower price options i would go for the entire 30 because even if you do you're not going to get the 30 anyway yep in addition you'll pay the 200 bucks but they're not going to necessarily get 30 people review it uh, number one number two it will take time it doesn't happen overnight so uh, considering that it doesn't happen overnight and considering that you don't get all 30 that you've paid for uh, I'd say go for the highest number so that you can have the most number of reviews in the shortest amount of time. If you go for the lower number, then, you know, it, it becomes almost like a diminishing return. It's uh, you're doing it, but it's not really doing one or two reviews. It doesn't make sense. Um, your, your, your approach is the most organic, of course. Exactly. You know, one thing I definitely want to stress is don't seek out fake reviews. 
You know, Amazon can sniff out fake reviews from a mile away. Don't text your group chat right now and say, hey, everyone, go give me a five-star review on Amazon and write these great comments. The Amazon AI and algorithm knows, can sniff it out from a mile away. So don't do fake reviews. I would just, you know, talk to customers. If you see them outside of the platform, ask them to actually buy the product and give a review. Run promos. It's a numbers game. The more people that buy the product, more likely to buy it on promo, the more likely they are to potentially give a review. Uh, reaching out afterwards. Also, too, I mean, one of the things that you could do is, depending on how your product is packaged, is providing some type of insert. Explain the customer, you know, to review the product. If you're sold in, uh, you know, it depends on your pack. And what I mean by an insert is, say your product is sold already in a four by four box. On the packaging side of stuff, you can maybe insert a sticker, insert a little postcard that tells the customer to, you know, uh, if you like this product, leave a review or however you want to word it. Whatever you do, though, don't derive them off of the platform. Don't in your insert say, hey, by the way, you can get for $2 cheaper on our store. Definitely don't do that. Keep them on the Amazon platform and organically ask for a review. Like I said, Amazon's going to sniff out if it's fake or faulty. So just let it happen organically. And it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. And you're going to continue to get reviews, 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 and it just exponentially grows. Yeah. So package inserts are huge. So everybody who is uh, able to have a package insert because they have the kind of packaging and that will accommodate it is, is key. Uh, there are two things that we've had on different episodes mentioned. One is obviously ask for a review. Yep. In your insert, ask for a review. And don't ask for five-star rating. Just ask for your honest uh, review. So uh, there is a, a verbiage, specific verbiage that, that I like to use. And uh, you don't try to influence the, the level of the review. The second thing is offer something of value as a giveaway. But... That has to be something that you should be able to deliver either physically mm -hmm. or uh, ideally it should be physical uh, so that way you can justify what you're doing where you can ask people, go register here so that we can send you this. Could be an extended warranty or it could be some uh, kind of a giveaway that is off value. Don't make it you know, real cheap looking, you know, fake just for the purposes of getting their address. But the offer something like the examples I can give you is I have a client who does floor coverings and it's epoxy floor coverings. And this is, it's a fairly high ticket item. It costs like 700 bucks and they sell really well on Amazon and they offer extended warranty. If something happens, they'll send you new. So when you spend $700 on an item and the warranty comes, that's value. So of course, you have to register. So now they have their direct information to be able to do business directly if they need it. Not to mention also getting the review. I have another one uh, that does um, uh, masks. These masks have filters in them. So you have to keep changing the filter. So what they offer is one year supply of those filters. If you register, so they'll send you a packet. So things like that are genuine value-based offers. It all comes out of the insert. And then of course, when people see that and then they see the review, the whole experience becomes fairly positive and, um, you know, you can you can bring like 50, 60, 70 reviews within a month if you do this. And then, of course, that means that you are also pushing volume. Yeah, no, just inserts are huge. I think people just sometimes need that reminder and a little bit of a nudge. People forget, you know, they're busy. They're getting 10,000 emails, sometimes just a physical piece. Believe it or not, this was like seven, eight years ago. But the most successful type of insert I ever did was like a Halloween promo wasn't my idea. I was just the one shipping at the time, but it was a trick or treat Halloween postcard, believe it or not. And it was like, it, it had like a 30% retention. Basically it was a postcard and it went, you have to mail the postcard in. And I've never seen a conversion rate like that. I mean, again, this was a while ago, but it was, uh, 
you know, it was just a piece of snail mail. I think some time was a little refreshing. It reminded people and they liked the whole aspect of it. So I definitely wouldn't be scared to get outside the box and just gently remind customers that, hey, you know, by the way, leave a review, even a handwritten note. Obviously, that one's been done many times by different businesses. But just, I think, something that isn't just the product. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had a guest on the show. Uh, they run a company called Post Purchase Pro. And this is all they do. Uh, they they design the whole process and and then they they do the emails and and everything else. So, uh, but their presentation was funny. He said they have to be able to notice the insert because a lot of the mm -hmm. times you don't notice it. So, what they've done is he actually because uh, in audio, you can't see it, but on the video, they, they demonstrate it. So what happens is, as soon as you open the package, this thing like jumps out. So it, it goes all over the place. It's like one of those uh, things that you put spring inside like the, a box. the jack in the box, yeah. The... <laughs> exactly, yes. So he says that that's the first rule. They have to be able to notice it. So we make it very easy to notice. So that way people can read, what's on it and then do take action. Yeah. Okay. And then I'll just stress again though. Remember your insert should be part of your P and L. If it's a $5 insert, make sure you're still profitable at the end of it. That's my one little, uh, my operation side note there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What we do is we actually incorporate that into the uh, item cost. So in the item cost, we have, again, the item cost breaks down as its own little sub categories first the production cost is getting the item produced and then the second thing is uh, if there are any uh, assembly costs like you may be putting a pack together or whatever and of course 3pl will charge so uh, getting that pack and then uh, you have your freight of course and uh, then the last one i usually call it processing and those are little things like the inserts and everything else so because what happens is in your accounting, you get billed by different people for yep. those costs and in bulk, even though you get billed for the product piece by piece. So uh, when you make your whole plan that we call it the unit economics in the template, we have those individual sub items, but we have one production cost and that's the, the main uh, tier in the whole accounting. But also inside that, we have individual accounting codes so that we can see exactly what is contributing to what. Zach, this is very useful, especially for someone having done it. You know, what are the lessons learned in terms of what to do, what not to do? What I want to also spend a few minutes talking about is the, uh, the future. And there are some new things going on. And uh, I want to cover those in terms of how you feel about it and how you feel is going to impact your business. Yeah, well, we're definitely at an interesting time just in the world in general, not just Amazon. You know, on one hand, I still am bullish and believe Amazon is the future. I was with some family the other day and someone mentioned, I like your pants. Where did you get them? And the first thing they said was, I got these pants on Amazon. They didn't even mention the brand. So Amazon is still the initial search point and that's where customers are heading. And that's why our product is even, we drive all of our e-commerce towards Amazon. But then on the other hand, I think it's a really interesting time for Amazon and you're seeing real competition. This is uh, a day after the Super Bowl and Tamu, the uh, the Chinese wholesale site, had like what six, seven advertisements during the Super Bowl and you're seeing customer shop there. You see TikTok shop, Instagram shop, direct store delivery with uh, Instacart and stuff like that really taking off. And you wonder if that's going to cut into some of the Amazon stuff. And then lastly, right, I've mentioned probably two or three times today in quotations, the Amazon algorithm, which for years was this big, bad, notorious thing that people would charge a gazillion dollars to tell you that they've cracked. I mean, maybe now that algorithm is really just chat GPT or a large lang language model hiding behind the counter. And now the playing field has been leveled and we all have access to it. So it's a really interesting time and wondering if Amazon's still going to be the king of, of, of e-commerce, the king of retail. 
So, I mean, if if I'm a betting man, I'm going to say at least for the next couple of years, Amazon has enough data to probably steer all that their way and own a big piece of that. But we're definitely at an interesting time for the first time I can remember where it was, where it's, we might branch off into a different sector. It might be a different avenue. We go down where it isn't just Amazon and we're be held to their data. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my take is this. So if you go back and, and look at the Amazon's early days, when I say early days, they, they are putting the, the whole infrastructure in place and they're building this culture, the company culture. But most important, Jeff Bezos was setting expectations by the investors, by the board and everything else. So, and that is ingrained in their DNA. So there are some characteristics there. One of them is we are going to try new things all the time and we are going to fail in most of them. Now, fast forward 30 years, what are we looking at? We're looking at a company that has reached massive audiences who pay a subscription, a yearly subscription to receive the benefits that seems to go up in multiple folds compared to any other inc price increases and nobody even blinks. They still stay. So that means that Amazon is delivering value and they have this, this audience that is loyal. Now, they are using that audience to test new programs all the time. They're doing that for two reasons, two reasons, the way I see it. In order to stay as the leader, you have to keep changing the rules of the game so that others can only try and play catch up. And by the time they do, you got something else. So they are always trying new things to stay as a leader and also keep delivering more and more and more value. So when you look at it that way and you've got a company that is, you know, cash is no problem. Yeah. I doubt very much that Amazon is going to really uh, go away anytime soon. Instead, they are going to be doing more and more. So therefore, it's up to the sellers to figure out how do we take advantage of it? I mean, that's my take. That's a really fair point. Um, another prediction here, I guess, and it goes hand in hand with your point where the sellers have to figure it out is we're seeing the Gen Z consumer come more into more of their, their buying prime where they have the disposable income now to, to make decisions and influence. And what do they care about? At least from my perspective, they care about sustainability, they care about company ethics, and they care about brand story. What is Amazon not known for? <laughs> sustainability, customer ethics, and you know, sometimes hashing out the brand. I do think the Gen Z customer cares about that stuff. So we're at an interesting point. It was how does the brand penetrate the Amazon, not just become pants on Amazon, but the brand becomes the first part of the sentence and can preach their ethics, sustainability to these consumers. So I think that's a big opportunity. But I mean, right, I, I put out these doomsday scenario, but you know, I know at the back of my head too, we both know Amazon's not, they're going to own it all. So, so yeah, yeah, it's up to the seller really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly it. So uh, the, the other thing that we were talking just before we started recording, so as we record this February 24, there are some fee new fees Amazon is bringing in and then also increasing their FBA fees and things like that. And I'd say before you go getting all panicky, look at the, the complete picture. So uh, they are also reducing the FBA fees. So when you incorporate all the changes that they are making, First of all, understand the full picture and see what kind of an impact that is going to make. And then also think about the big picture. What is it that they are trying to do? So, for example, one of the things that is a big deal is the storage fees. So Amazon makes it more and more and more expensive to carry stock. But why is that? Because it's not in your best interest as a seller, to invest so much into inventory if it's not selling fast enough. So 
This is the biggest problem that I see with sellers. They don't understand the impact of the amount of inventory they carry on their health in general as their seller account as well as their personal because it creates stress. You, you never have enough money. By the time you bring in the sales, already you've invested into inventory and the bill becomes due and only uh, a third of the inventory is sold. So if you are carrying more and more and more of it all the time, it's not good for you. Amazon is charging you more. I just say, look at the big picture. What is it that they're trying to do and bring those best practices in? Uh, what do you think? Yep. I mean, back to the accounting piece of it, it's cash conversion cycle. And that's a really fair point too. Cause when they, you know, you know, I was among the Amazon sellers when the email came out, we're raising fees where I'm, you know, yelling, you know, cursing the, the sky at Amazon. They're always doing this. Never this, this channel is going to fail. Tamu's going to take, you know, all that stuff. But you have to look at the full picture. And I think we use it as actually very helpful to, to level set where, you know, at the end of the day, right, you need to be converting your, your inventory into cash as soon as possible by carrying more, holding on to more inventory. You know, you wouldn't do that outside of Amazon. So why do it in there as well? And it's all a big piece of the puzzle. So you have to kind of, you have to level set it as well. And if storage costs are going down or by the way around, if storage costs are going slightly up, but FBA costs are going down, then it all comes out to be a little bit equal. And it goes back to just general inventory and business practices where you're just, again, converting that cash cycle where you're sending inventory and it's only going out the door. My yeah. one pain point that I'll provide though is, is shipping to Amazon. It's always been a little bit of a difficulty. Uh, right now in Seller Central, if you were to initiate a work order and send inventory there, generally, at least for us right now, they're splitting it into three, four different orders. And those three, four different orders will be entered in at different points. It could be a week, it could be three days, it could be 60 days. And that sometimes varies, which is to counteract that, I've always been of the mindset, let me send a little bit more and just in case it takes longer time to enter and just factor that in, have a little bit of safety stock. So it's a little bit that you can't send a little bit more, all equals out. So, I mean, at the bottom line, the costs are the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, those are things that uh, always something to consider. All right. So what I'm really to sum up, I can see that you've done well with the launch and you are positive about the future just there is no blinking you know you have to stay on top of the game and keep monitoring right that's the idea Zach yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very proud about how we've um, you know our initial Amazon success we've hit a lot a lot of our success from the app side on the marketing side our founder CEO has done a really great job of positioning our brand and go hand in hand I think to have success and really proud to, to say that we've had a lot of success we've had really good customer feedback and uh, I encourage your audience to go check out Ruby Sparkling Hibiscus for enhanced hydration. So you're getting all the benefits of hibiscus, that enhanced hydration, and the refreshment of sparkling water. It's a really fun, unique product, and we're, uh, we're very happy with what we're doing. Great. Uh, glad to hear all that. And uh, I'm sure people will check it out and uh, see, make a purchase, write a review, and uh, reach out and tell you uh, how how they feel about it. Yeah, please, please. Great. Thank you, Zach. So share your contact information with us and how can people reach you? Yeah, the best way to, uh, always happy to share different nuggets from CPG, operations, and uh, Amazon. So always happy to connect there. And yeah, thanks again for having me. Really good to always talk Amazon and, and connect. And thanks for having me back. Yeah, thank you. And it's always a pleasure. Like I said at the beginning, I'm always happy to see people still continuing, growing and pushing. And we need people to be successful and just maintain the longevity. That's the key. All right. Well, thank you, Zach. Thank you for being here. And um, this brings us to the end of another episode. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe, rate and review the episode and share it with someone you think would benefit from it too.